All right, we are live with uh, David Johnston. So, David, uh, how are you today? I'm doing great. It's good to hang out again. Uh, yes, it is. It is. And so, maybe I should make it clear that today. Uh, so, David, you, you mentioned that you are driving. So, we're gonna we're gonna keep you focused on the road and and keep it more just like a an audio, uh, you know, interview. All good. I'm hands free. Perfect. So let's get started. Um, I'd usually like to start with where did we first meet? Um, where did we, I don't, I don't even know if you remember, but how did you and I first connect, David? Do you remember? Uh, I believe it was one of the early Bitcoin conferences or events. You know, I was sort of running around a lot in 2013, 2014, spending a lot of time you know, speaking at conferences and I'm pretty sure we ran it to each other. Maybe it was in Canada, either when I came up to Toronto um, or at one of the other events, but uh, I remember yeah. we ended off pretty early. Uh, I, I, yeah, I kind of lose track. I mean, I do remember us having a chat when I was in India in 2012, maybe 2013. And I was yep. trying to get into Bitcoin. You were one of the voices kind of, you know, on the internet. Um, and I, again, I don't remember how, maybe Twitter, maybe some other way, but I remember you and I were actually like on a, a Skype call, I guess that was like the thing back then, right? And uh, that, I don't know if you're, mm, do you remember <laughs> this? I don't even, and again, I don't even remember how we connect the dots. Somehow, somehow we did. And I don't know if a lot of people know it, but like um, it, it was actually in a conversation with you where, you know, we kind of came up with the idea, right? Of UnoCoin, where you were asking me some questions around, you know, how easy is it to get Bitcoin in India? Do you remember this? <laughs> right. Yeah, no, it, it's funny. Back in the day, you know, pre-Slack, pre, you know, sort of a lot of the chat apps, everybody was on uh, Skype. I remember even that's where uh, the Vitalik dropped the white paper into a, into a Skype group that a few of us were in and, and sort of sparked from there. And so, yeah, I, it was probably, I don't know, maybe the BBA, uh, Bitcoin Business Association, who knows who knows but, but somehow we connected around, right? <laughs> yeah. um hey so david so okay so in terms of uh like you know my first i guess question right as i was mentioning earlier is is really around um you know you've done a lot of big things in the space uh and, and we're gonna obviously get to those but i wanted to start with uh with kind of you know your story prior to learning about you know the bitcoin white paper Sure. Um, you know, grew up in Columbia, Maryland, uh, near Washington, D.C., you know, and uh, grew up, I guess, very curious. You know, I was homeschooled uh, for the first six years, so really sort of got the opportunity to, you know, set my own interests and go after my, you know, uh, my interest in history and economics and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, got to do cool stuff. Like when I was 12, I convinced my dad to open a, a stock trade account, right? And so, you know, I was trading stocks during the first internet bubble and, you know, learning about all of that, you know, ended up starting a bunch of tech companies. When I was pretty young, um, I'll date myself and say that one of my first projects was doing online publishing back when that was cutting edge. <laughs> so, you know, books on the internet, I'll tell you, it's going to be the future. Uh, so, yeah, no, it's sort of that curiosity you know, and, and interest in economics, I guess, served me well and sort of laid the groundwork for what would come later in, in crypto. You know, a lot of my economic influences, you know, F.A. Hayek, Murray Rothbard, you know, uh, Mises, you know, of course, is, you know, these guys that I, I found out about not till maybe 2007, you know, and, you know, that sort of really prepped me for being very bullish on a non-governmental currency. Um, and so, yeah, you know, I'm, other experiences, uh, I don't know if you remember Second Life <laughs> back in the day, right? I, 100%. World. Yeah, of course. Yep. So 2005, 2006, I was actually building an investment company inside of Second Life using the Linden dollar, if you remember that. And so that was my first exposure to virtual currency and to see all the cool things that people would do with you know, digital property and, you know, they were building all these cool applications in the world. Uh, but I don't know if you remember how that ended. What killed Second Life? 
Tell me, I'm interested. In January of 2007, the regulators basically came in. They're like, do you know what people are doing in the world? They're, they're doing, you know, securities and stock markets and gambling and all these crazy things. You have to shut everything down, right? And so Linden Labs, the company in California that ran Second Life, basically overnight killed the economy. And it was really too bad. They were on this amazing trajectory, right? They had 5 million users and was growing at these amazing percentages. But sort of overnight, they, they gutted the most interesting applications of the technology because of regulation, right? What year was this, so, David? What year did it, like, did it, did it shut down? 2007 is when the regulators came in. I think Linden Labs started Second Life back in 2003, 2004. Um, and I was involved from 2005 to 2006, right? And fortunately, I had exited just before uh, the regulators came in and sort of things got really uh, uninteresting. But, uh, but yeah, this is super early on. This is pre-Bitcoin. Yeah, no, I was talking about Suthik about this actually just so, in uh, uh, about Linden Dollars and all that because he he had a, a like an interest in a business in that space prior to getting into Bitcoin. Anyways, yeah, continue. Sure. So I mean, that kind of set it up for when I heard about you know Bitcoin in 2012. You know, a friend turned to me and said, you know, do you hear Bitcoin hit ten dollars? And I said, you know, what's Bitcoin? And uh, after he finished explaining it, I was like wait, there's a non-governmental currency that will never be inflated by politicians and is controlled by mass. Yeah, I'd like to take my green pieces of paper and switch for that, right? <laughs> and so it took me about four months at the time. It wasn't easy, right? This is like Mount Gox sending $500 a day on MoneyGram at a red phone in Walmart. Like that was the, that was the way you got in. And, uh, you know, so, but unfortunately I was able to, you know, hold on to those Bitcoins. I didn't get caught in on Gox or anything. I was just tech savvy enough to be running my own Bitcoin. Now. Okay, we're back, uh, David. Sorry about that technical glitch. But yeah, so carry on. Yeah, so I mean, really all of that knowledge from Second Life and you know that experience really sort of set the, the stage for in 2012, you know, when a friend turned to me and said, hey, did you hear Bitcoin hit $10? You know, when I said, what's Bitcoin? And he explained it. And, you know, there's sort of, wow, you know, there's a non-governmental currency that is never going to be inflated by politicians and controlled by mass. You know, I'd like to change my green pieces of paper for that. Right. So I was, I was definitely already in the right set mindset when it came to the economics. I had seen with Second Life what people would do with digital currency and sort of how transformational it could be. And what I saw in Bitcoin was a uncensorable Linden dollar, right? Basically, it moved the compliance from, you know, a company in California to an open protocol that operated globally and was fully decentralized. I, I thought that was really incredible. And so ended up converting, you know, uh, my cash into Bitcoin. It wasn't easy back then, right? It was uh, Mt. Gox and you're sending $500 a day on MoneyGram via red phone at Walmart. <laughs> I mean, the what, infrastructure what, what, was, uh, what, was really crude. What year was it, <laughs> 2011 or? This was, this was uh, 2012, 2012 uh, is okay. when it hit uh, 10 bucks again. Yeah, yeah it, it made a run up to 30, 32 back in, in 2011, but it corrected back down to a dollar or two. And so by the time I heard about it in uh, mid-2012, it had made its way back up to ten dollars, and uh, it was sort of becoming clear to people, "Hey, this thing isn't going away," you know. Um, and so I was, I was really curious to get get involved. And after I converted my money into Bitcoin, I started, you know, obviously spending a lot of time on the forums. Ended up going uh, and uh, speaking at the first Bitcoin conference in May of 2013 in San Jose by the Bitcoin Foundation. And so I'd already been building startups for a long time, so they asked me to talk about how to build startups in the Bitcoin space. So that kind of really kicked everything off. Interesting. So you spoke at, at that conference in 2013, you said? Yep. May of 2013, the Bitcoin Foundation had their first conference in San Jose, California. It was, it was sort of like the Woodstock moment for the industry in a lot of ways. You know, everybody had been hanging out online 
and the price of Bitcoin had really started to run. Uh, they crossed like $100 at the time. You know, the first VC investment in the Coinbase by Union Square had just been made a few months earlier. Uh, the FinCEN had finally put out their guidance in March of 13. So it was like, okay, you know, they're not going to ban this thing. They're they're gonna they're gonna regulate it, you know, via the exchanges and and so you know things were becoming more clear and so there was just huge excitement in the air. You know, here's Roger Bear, you know, talking about his projects. You know, uh, the Ripple guys were there, the founders. You know, uh, Coinbase team was there. They had a little booth, right? Fred and and Brian. You know, it was still a very small team at the time. You know, and so all those early players were sort of there, bumping around in uh, May of 13. And uh, I ended up uh, me meeting Michael Turpin the first night. And uh, we were chatting about sort of, you know, surprising there wasn't an angel group in the space yet. And uh, I said, well, let's go ahead and start one. And he said, okay, great. We'll call it Bid Angels. And I said, cool. You know, we'll have our first meeting tomorrow. I'll throw up a website. And so <laughs> the second day of the conference, we ended up basically starting, you know, I put up a post on Reddit, I slapped up a website, and the second day we had like 30 people show up to the first meeting of the Bit Angels. We crashed the hackathon area, like took over a table and like held our first meeting about what we were going to invest in in the space. Um, it ended up getting picked up in TechCrunch, and so we got a bunch of coverage, and within a few weeks, we had 500 members globally that were taking part in Bit Angels. You know, we had people all over the world volunteering as sort of like city leaders in Chicago and New York and Hong Kong and everywhere. And so it's amazing just how quickly it sort of sparked. And uh, so I ended up serving as the executive director for the Bit Angels in, in 2013 and basically doing the due diligence on all the projects and having a weekly call with all the angels around the world about what we were going to invest in next. And so that really sort of set me on a fully different trajectory because we were looking things at like MasterCoin. You know, J.R. Willett, uh, based in Seattle at the time, uh, invented MasterCoin and, and was doing the first world's first token sale in August of 2013. And he came to the group, I think like four days before the uh, the end of the token sale, it's like, hey, I've got a way to put assets on the blockchain. And I was like, that's great. I've been looking for the first project that would put assets on the blockchain. I dived into the due diligence and uh, released all the information to the group. And he ended up raising uh, a good uh, four or $5 million, I think, of Bitcoin at the time. And uh, you know that really sort of sparked this, this revolution, right? Everybody looked at what he had done with you know, creating a Bitcoin address, collecting uh, funds, and then issuing tokens uh, for a new protocol, right? And that sort of became that, you know, sort of early proto ICO model, even back in 2013. Interesting. Hey, David, I just can ask you, are you outside right now or are you indoors? I'm not, I'm I, have indoors. A bit of, I have a little bit of, I don't know why, a little bit of wind or something in the background, but it's okay. Um, okay, so that that is fascinating. And MasterCoin, for all intents and purposes, was like the first, I guess you could say, imagination of turning Bitcoin into a Swiss Army knife, right? Where where like the question around, can we use this decentralized network to do other applications outside of just money? Is that is that correct? Yeah, I mean that was really Jr.'s uh, vision, and you know he said, hey. There's this, you know, memo field, if you will. There's this uh, ability to put um, a little bit of data into the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, and at the time, he was using, you know, sort of the UTXO set. Um, or later on, you could do it via multi-signature or op, op return. And you could put a little bit of data on a Bitcoin transaction. He said, look, this is simple. We can interpret that data to be more than just a Bitcoin transaction. You know, we can say this is a digital gold coin. This is a, you know, coin that represents uh, some application uh, and so forth. And so that was sort of his insight. Now, a lot of the Bitcoin uh, core developers were not really a fan of this. They just wanted to keep Bitcoin for Bitcoin transactions. They didn't want other applications or other assets growing on the network. 
work. And so there was a lot of tension early on, you know, and, and a lot of people, you know, sort of against the project. But, you know, my view is Bitcoin ought to be a permissionless decentralized network. And so, you know, everybody can have their opinion, but I didn't think uh, a group of people should be able to stop this type of application. So I, you know, went forward as supporting the project anyway, you know, helped JR form the, the foundation for MasterCoin, uh, served on the board of the, the open source foundation for the first year. And so that's where we got a, early projects like Tether, right? I mean, that was one of the first tokens was a US dollar token to launch on in 2014 on the MasterCoin protocol, which eventually rebranded as the Omni protocol uh, later on. And so that continued for years to have the most value of any uh, tokens in the world. Even after the launch of Ethereum, it took Ethereum two or three years to catch up with the assets that have been launched on, on the Omni protocol, largely thanks to, uh, to Tether. So it was sort of very interesting how it all developed. And, and that really inspired you know, Vitalik, you know, he, he was writing his own white papers at the time about how to do scripting on a blockchain, how to do programming on a blockchain, and, uh, you know, put some of those proposals forth to the, the MasterCoin uh, Foundation. And, you know, effectively, it was like, yeah, this sounds great. You know, we, we can we can do this uh, after we deliver the initial version. But he wanted to get going and, and get uh, get off the ground. So ended up spinning out and creating the Ethereum. Interesting. Interesting. So can you talk a little bit more about that in the sense that, so I know, I know there's obviously, you know, Vitalik's mentioned many times that he traveled around the world and saw a lot of these protocols being built on top of Bitcoin, uh, felt like perhaps the level of innovation or the pace of innovation wasn't at the speed that, that they, that he wanted and uh, but like, what is that? Well, yeah. Like, and what, when, what are your thoughts in terms of like, the birth of Ethereum and, and how that's kind of evolved over the years. Sure. Um, you know, Vitalik was in such a great position thanks to all of his writing at Bitcoin Magazine. You know, his, right. his writing about all of the protocols, and he wrote up like the first technical analysis of the MasterCoin protocol, for example, and did a very good job of sort of taking a neutral stance Whereas sort of a lot of people get pulled into uh, the tribal politics, you know, either MasterCoin was, was the greatest thing ever, or it was an attack on Bitcoin because it was, you know, putting data on the blockchain, right? And he came up with a much more nuanced sort of computer science view of the whole thing and gave people the real deal on what these protocols were doing. And you had other protocols like Next and you know, counterparty and a bunch of other things that were popping up after MasterCoin. And so he had sort of curated um, this, this great technical analysis of all these protocols. And I think he was just in that position to say, what we really need is something more powerful, where instead of hardwiring into a protocol, you can make token X or you can make token Y, just give me, you know, Turing complete scripts. <laughs> right. Just let me program on the blockchain and we can unleash sort of the real power of, of decentralization. And so that was that was his vision. Uh, you know, he wrote the, the white paper, uh, dropped it into a, a Skype group uh, with a bunch of us. And that that group basically just exploded. There was all this interest. Uh, this is late 2013 uh, in the idea. And it became clear that he effectively could launch his own protocol without having to sort of uh, be subservient to the more narrow uh, vision the Bitcoin developers had for Bitcoin, right? The Bitcoin core developers were not on board for, you know, scripting and programming language, all this stuff. They're like, no, 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 no. We want to keep it really simple. We just want to do Bitcoin transactions, right? But, and so rather than fight sorry, sorry. that, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah. Rather than fight that, he started it. Yeah, yeah. Rather than fight that sort of, you know, tension, it, it just decided to start his own project. And so I think that was that was definitely a good call because others before Vitalik had spent years trying to figure out some way to, you know, shoehorn in these applications to Bitcoin, and it just wasn't going anywhere. You know, I'm, I'm talking about predecessors 
to master coin like colored coins, right? This idea of, you know, coloring a transaction, adding some metadata had been around for years, um, but effectively there wasn't enough capacity on the Bitcoin network and enough flexibility to do it. Interesting, fascinating. Uh, by the way, I'm going to be, I think I'm, uh, I'm interviewing Anthony, one of the co-founders as well of, of Ethereum on, uh, on this weekend. So it'll be interesting to kind of hear his perspective as well. Um, and, and, and also I th- I'm trying to get a meeting with Yanni uh, as well, one of the guys behind Color Coin. So, so sure. I, you know, I think it's, I think it's just fascinating. But, but, you know, I guess from like a more of a technical perspective, then uh, from what I heard, Bitcoin was or is Turing complete, but that element of it was almost like purposefully disabled because it was seen as a bit of a, a, a an attack vector, if you will. Um, is that factual or I don't know, what are your thoughts around like, like, you know, that nuance, which you just mentioned, which is like, you know, the, the engineers or like the, the, the team behind Bitcoin did not want to make Bitcoin, let's say, be able to do everything. They wanted to keep it focused on this like singular focus of like, you know, trying to figure out money, if you will. Uh, yeah. But, but can you expand a bit more on that in the sense that, um, I don't know. I don't know. In terms of um, so, so Mastercoin, you said evolved into Omni, which is now used for USDT. But like, w- w- yeah, I guess that, that the main question is around like um, that argument, right? So that 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 surface uh, surface attack or vector area type of argument. Like, what, does it actually do so, or like, what are your thoughts on it then versus now? I, I think that's a pretty accurate description. You know, clearly Satoshi was interested in scripts, right? He included some in uh, the Bitcoin design and in the early operation, he ended up sort of uh, making those inoperable uh, because he was worried about the attack vectors and, and they were sort of outside the initial scope of just you know creating peer-to-peer digital cash, right? And so if, if digital cash is your objective, you don't necessarily need all of all of these scripts. So a lot of them were, were disabled. And we've actually seen an example of, of the risk uh, just recently. So um, the BSV uh, chain had made some alteration uh, to their multi-sig uh, scripts. And I think just this last week, somebody found a bug and was able to drain all the multi-sig uh, addresses because they had made a mistake not only were um, you know x x number of signatures valid, zero signatures were valid, valid, right? And so basically, somebody could sign a transaction without a valid signature and, and take the funds out of the multisig. So, with complexity comes risk, right? With complexity comes more edge cases. So I think that was a valid concern, and you know the way uh, Ethereum does. Uh, deals with this is it sets a series of standards, right? There's a lot of Ethereum inf- improvement proposals. You know, everybody's familiar with uh, ERC-20 is the, you know, 20th improvement, right? It was the uh, 20th uh, standard, if you will, and it set how to issue a token in a in a validated and, and standard way, right? And there have been a bunch of upgrades to that ever since. There have now been thousands of Ethereum improvement proposals, but all of those are, are effectively seeking to modularize, modularize and, and limit complexity in these things so everybody interprets them the right way or, or the same way, right? And so that's certainly a risk, and we've seen a lot of smart contract um, type of vulnerabilities, right? Over the years, people have, you know, even famously in the DAO, right? That smart contract had, you know, $150 million of ETH in it back when ETH's total market cap was a billion dollars, right? So 15% of all ETH was in that contract. And when it had a bug, you know, the attackers started draining all the funds, right? And so that ended up being such a crisis that they, they had a split in the chain, right? And you got Ethereum and Ethereum Classic, right? So I think the concern is real, but maybe it's sort of, uh, a different philosophy, you know, in order to move the tech forward, how much risk are you willing to take? And, you know, if, if the existing protocols were unwilling to take those risks, then, you know, um, 
somebody who is willing to take that risk is, is going to launch a new protocol. And we see this playing out again today with people that are trying to compete with Ethereum, right? Ethereum's become a big project. They're not moving as fast as they used to, and they're not taking as many risks because they've got 40, 50 billion dollars of market cap uh, at stake, right? And so you'd see this slow, cautious rollout of Ethereum 2.0 as, as an example, whereas Ava and, you know, uh, Casper and, you know, people building Cardano, all these alternatives are, are moving faster because they've got less at risk and they're willing to take, you know, sort of more of an aggressive approach. Fascinating, fascinating. Okay, so in terms of, I guess, your the, like the arc of your story, we've, we've touched on, you know, kind of like prior to Bitcoin, after Bitcoin, you've now gotten to the point where we've talked about MasterCoin, the emergence of Ethereum, which is now what year? 2015, is it? Where are we now in, in the time frame of things here? Uh, this is August of 2013, MasterCoin. Uh, did their token sale. I served on their board of directors. They launched in April of 2014. So they actually turned around the uh, the code and delivered it uh, fairly quickly uh, in the eight months following uh, the token sale. Um, you know, and then people started launching, you know, USDT and other tokens in 2014. I ended up starting the, uh, the first um, fund, venture fund, to effectively only do tokens. Right. So we only took Bitcoin and MasterCoin as contributions. We only invested in token projects. This is in uh, in early 2014. And that was called the DAPS Fund. And uh, that was that was a really great experience because it sort of gave us a lot of access to the early protocols, you know, ended up writing the, you know, the paper on on Ethereum as far as, uh, you know, the, the sort of the informational report uh, before their launch, encouraging people to get involved there. Um, but probably what people most know me for is decentralized applications. So uh, in December of 2013, I wrote the general theory of decentralized applications and published that paper uh, right about the same time that, that Dan and Charles were writing about decentralized autonomous corporations. And then shortly after, uh, Charles was talking about DAOs, right? And so, you know, having that, uh, you know, sort of all in the ether at the time, if you will, you know, you had, you know, what was going on with, with the uh, DAPs, you had what was going on with the DAOs and the DAX. There's actually a great old video of me, Dan and Charles all debating the, uh, the terms. I think it's still on YouTube and uh, that was probably early 2014. So, you know, we're kind of figuring out all those those ideas at the time and that, that idea of dApps really took off, right? And people adopted that decentralized application language. Ethereum even described itself early on as a platform for decentralized applications. So, you know, it's been interesting to see the language evolve, but that was sort of one of my big contributions to the, the ecosystem and the thinking at the time. And, and effectively what I was arguing was there, we could take the things that were great about Bitcoin. We could take, you know, the advantages it, it had uh, when it came to, you know, uh, working with, you know, open source, peer to peer, uh, it was all based on a blockchain and there was a token to incentivize a uh, certain behavior, right? In the case of, of Bitcoin, it was proof of work, right? And, and that secured the transactions. But I said, hey guys, we can take this model and expand it to so many other things, right? And that, that's what the DAPS paper is all about. So it was really amazing to see people sort of take that initiative and run with it and uh, start building all the decentralized applications. That is super cool. Um, so I guess, what are your thoughts on how that has, I mean, it could be argued, I guess, that ICOs were, one potential DAP, um, you know, it could be argued that, again, I mean, you're seeing DeFi now, um, you know, you, we also saw, like you mentioned, stable coins, quite possibly one of the biggest maybe DAPs. Uh, but yeah, but just curious to know. So like, you know, it, it was interesting that, that you, you kind of foresaw a lot of this 
um, well before anyone else was even thinking about it or talking about it. But how is it? How has it played out now? Like in terms of your, yeah, like uh, has it been kind of like exactly what you had imagined, or or you know? Um, I think it's pretty much um, gone. Sort of in in twenty fourteen, I was speaking at Coin Summit in San Francisco. And, you know, I was on stage with Vitalik uh, talking about decentralized applications and Ethereum and MasterCoin. And I, I put forth that, uh, you know, John, I jokingly put forth Johnston's law, everything that can be decentralized will be decentralized. And <laughs> somebody tweeted that out and it, it really caught on. But and that's really my philosophy is I think people are going to take this technology and this approach and they're going to apply it one by one to all the interesting use cases, right? And so, and that sort of encapsulates things, everything that can be decentralized, right? It's a good caveat, right? Because it hasn't you know, been decentralized yet. Well, you know, it, it, uh, it's just a matter of time, right? It's an inevitability uh, that everything will be decentralized. Um, but I think of it as a tech stack, right? We needed decentralized money first. Right. You couldn't really do a lot of the other use cases without that. You needed, you know, then decentralized computation. Right. That's how I think of Ethereum. Right. It's a decentralized way to run programs. Right. The world computer, if you will. Right. And then step by step, we got decentralized, you know, custody with with multi-sig. And, you know, we got, you know, uh, projects now like Filecoin that are literally decentralizing data storage. You know, and, and we're getting projects like Helium where you're decentralizing, you know, uh, people putting up networks, right, and running internet infrastructure. So one by one, we're getting there. And like you said, DeFi has really exploded onto the scene. So now we have decentralized exchanges and decentralized automated market makers. And piece by piece, we're putting together this new world. Right. And with every new piece, it becomes easier to build the next generation of tech on top. I want to ask you what the next thing is, but uh, but I also want to stay on track with your story. Uh, what what happens next after all this? So you, so Ethereum comes into the scene, but th when did Ethereum, when was it born exactly? 2015? Uh, they did the sale in 2014. In 2014, um, it okay. didn't deliver till yeah it didn't launch until late uh 2015 and really it was very janky early on very difficult to use it wasn't until 2016 and you had erc20 and the ease of issuing tokens that ethereum really sort of took over and become the dominant uh project in that space and so you know uh after the daps fund i started yeoman's capital my family office effectively built on this vision, right, to only invest in blockchain, peer-to-peer, -peer, open source, and tokenized projects. So that's sort of what I've been doing ever since, is investing in these blockchain uh, and other projects, right? And it's interesting, people tend to know me from, you know, um, my, my interest or advocacy for one project or another, right? So, uh, you know, oh, Dave, the dApps guy, or oh, Dave, the MasterCoin guy, or Oh, Dave, you know, uh, you know, the Ethereum guy or whatever. Right. And so, you know, but, but often, you know, I'm trying to enable those projects. I'm, I'm usually not the inventor of the protocol. Right. Um, but I, I tend to write and speak a lot about them. And so people sort of highly associate me with particular projects. My real goal is to decentralize the world, right. To, to fulfill that, that goal of, of, you know, decentralizing everything. That's what I work on day in, day out. And I'm always looking for the next generation of the technology, whether now we're seeing decentralized stable coins, now we're seeing, you know, decentralized uh, synthetic or pegged assets, right? So that, that's been taking up a lot of my time recently because I think those things are, are finally possible with the current set of technology. So that sort of take me through 2015, 2016, 2017, you know, uh, went through this bear market and just kind of kept uh, heads down, uh, still trying to support all of these decentralized projects in, in 2018 and 2019. So, 
you know, here we are in 2020 and, and that's still the mission. And it's really fun to go through another uh, bull run. Looks like, you know, Bitcoin crossed 16,000 this morning. Um, but, uh, you know, for, for me, it's, it's sort of uh, just good validation that we're, we're on the right track. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So, so I guess to just to kind of sum up then, it, it just seems like you're pretty laser focused on your most of your family office and, and making kind of these like strategic bets on what you think are the next like big, you know, dApps, if you will. So it was very, very uh, in line with, I guess, yeah, what, uh, what you've been up to. Um, just curious, uh, what is next? Or I mean, if you had to take a guess, do you, is that something you're even willing to share? Or uh, yeah, from your perspective, sure. what's next? Sure. I mean, one of the projects that I've been most interested in uh, this last year is, is called Pegnet, uh, P-E-G-N-E-T. And it's all about this idea of pegging assets um, to real world values, right? So how do we build, you know, pegged gold and pegged dollars and, and all of these assets not based on a central reserve, not based on pool collateral, but based on oracles, right? And so uh, I, I talked to the early uh, inventors and, and developers behind the community in 2019. I like that they launched with, with uh, CPU-based mining. There was no pre-mine, there's no formal team, there's no ICO. It was just a pure organic community launch, you know, and we've seen almost $10 billion of pegged assets be converted and transferred on the network just in the last year since it's launched, right? And so that's been really amazing to to see because it's a fundamentally different approach. What, well, what I, what I like is when what people take a different approach. Everything you can what imagine. If you go to Pegnet hmm. if you go to pegnetmarketcap.com, you can see all of the different assets, but it's pegged gold, pegged dollars, pegged pounds, pegged bitcoins, you know, uh pegged uh you know, Ethereum, you know, basically the top 20 cryptos, the top 20 fiats, gold and silver, you know, all these different assets. And the way it works is the miners and stakers are reporting the price of these assets every 10 minutes based on exchanges and oracles around the world. And so I think that's really novel because effectively it, it takes out the risk of pooled collateral, it takes out the central party that typically provides, you know, uh, capital or, or holds a reserve, right? And it really reminds me of the sort of the Bitcoin model. Like if you think back to 2013, people were still saying like, but, but Bitcoin's not based on anything. It's not backed by anything. And Satoshi would say, yeah, that's the point. Because it's not backed by anything in the sense of gold or dollars, there's no account to seize. And there's no pooled collateral, so there's no hack that's going to drain everybody's funds. Everybody holds their own keys. And it, he was right that all you needed was the utility of the network. You needed the scarcity of a limited number of tokens and the right economic incentives. And you could build and bootstrap this multi-hundred billion dollar network purely based on, on economics and you know the, the utility of being able to send money, right? And that's that's a really good insight because I think a lot of people sort of lost the plot, right? They they've taken this great new technology and they've applied these old models to it. And what I'm usually looking for is like who's applying the new model to the new technology, right? And so I, I love this idea of creating something entirely based on oracles using the truth of data anchored to the blockchain to set uh, all of the, the, the numbers instead of using centralized solutions. It's always easier to just plug in a centralized solution, but you create points of failure. Let, let's take, for example, what happened to, to Bitmax recently. You know, they've gotten a lot of uh, legal issues and they were pooling collateral and who knows what was going on there, but it was run by a central company, right? And so doing derivatives or synthetics, all this stuff as a central company just doesn't make sense. The whole reason Bitcoin worked is there was no company 
It was just an open protocol. And people could build exchanges on top and they could do the compliance at a, a local level in their jurisdiction, but that didn't affect the operation of the network itself. And so I think we got to go back to those kind of fundamentals if you want to make real breakthroughs. Can you talk about oracles? Are they not a centralized mechanism? And by definition, do they not continue to need to be? And how do you decentralize that? Because it seems to me that to be able to do a lot of this, you, you need to solve that part of the puzzle. Isn't that your, your That's a really great tool? question. I mean, mm -hmm. Well, that's a really great question. And, and in the case of, of small projects or in the case of, you know, um, working with, you know, um, projects where there's only a few price uh, reports, it's very hard because you have to have a decentralization of the oracles themselves, right? So, but for large assets, you know, like Bitcoin or Ethereum or gold or, you know, dollars, there are dozens or hundreds of, of price points that you can get, right? And you can aggregate those, those price points and try to come up with sort of what is what's the closest thing to the true price or the accurate price. And so the PegNet community has spent a lot of time the last year figuring out all the edge cases around how you secure oracles, right? Do you trust miners to report them? Um, they've added staking, for example. So people holding the token, you know, have staked more than a million dollars now and are reporting the prices. So you're getting them from miners, you're getting them from stakers, you're getting them from dozens of different sources. You're, you know, detecting if there's, there's errors in the data, if like the API goes off the rails from an exchange. There's a lot of work that has to be done to really make those oracles robust. And this whole approach is only as strong as those oracles, right? And so you, you can't really do this with small projects where they're traded on one exchange, which might be manipulated, um, but it works for really decentralized assets that have a lot of liquidity, a lot of exchanges, a lot of uh, different prices set around the world. Um, that would be very hard to game. And so it's going to be interesting to see it evolve. But, you know, already it's, it's had sort of, I think, a, a big impact and sort of a fundamentally different way of, of doing things. Very interesting. Very interesting. Hey, um, Okay, so David, if, if, if we kind of, I guess, close the loop on, you know, your story and also some of the projects you've been a part of, um, was there anything else on that note, by the way, that you wanted to share before we maybe move on to, I don't know, some of the more like contrarian beliefs or whatnot? No, I, I think that's, that's great. You know, it's, it's fun to kind of trace the history of where this has all come from, you know, where it's, where it's at now and where it's headed. But uh, yeah, happy to, to jump into other subjects and, and dive in yeah yeah and, and you know I, you know, I, I know that i don't um you know i just started this right like a couple weeks ago um i'm on episode number 20 something to almost 30 now but um but, but but part of my goal is to create like evergreen content that revolves around stories right bitcoin stories mainly because I haven't really seen it. Um, like I, I see a lot of like commentary around like, you know, what happened last week and price and this and that and outsiders looking in, but I haven't seen many, uh, you know, interviewers out there like where it's like the insiders looking out, if you know what I mean. Um, and so that's kind of my goal is to, right. to put a spotlight on guys like you that, you know, just as like a little side note, you inspired a couple of guys out in India to start, you know, um uno coins so and not to mention all the other amazing things you inspired guys like metallic in toronto to to maybe or maybe not fully inspired but you know you had a hand in inspiring guys like him i'm sure to to do ethereum and uh so just wanted to you know kind of capture some of this and and share it with uh my mini universe here okay so david what about um uh, yeah, like what, 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 so like I said, that, that famous Peter Thiel question, what, what, what's one truth that you hold that most others would disagree with you on in Bitcoin? Well, purely in the Bitcoin universe, um, you know, I, I've been sort of the outspoken voice to say, you know, it's okay, it's positive to have coins other than Bitcoin. 
And in fact, it makes Bitcoin stronger. You know, people can tend to get in this tribalistic men mindset where, you know, they only want Bitcoin to succeed and everything else is, is terrible or a scam or something like that. But the truth is there are different use cases for this technology, right? I like to think about it like uh, programming languages. You know, you know, JavaScript might be a wonderful programming language, but it's okay that there's C++ or Go or Rust or other programming languages that serve other use cases, right? And so, you know, I really tried to uh, sort of, uh, you know, stake that ground out. And, you know, it, it, it came at sort of a, a cost. Uh, a lot of people said, oh, you know, this is, this Ethereum thing's never going to work or, you know, it's, it's a scam, you know, that they didn't do a, a purely, you know, mining based launch. Um, but you have to think and, and remember the context at the time, you know, Ethereum came out in 2014 or, or did their token sale in 2014 at a time in which mining had already become pretty industrialized, right? ASICs were on the scene, you know, people were building big operations. It wasn't the 2009, anybody can run it on their computer days anymore, right? And so if you're trying to build a network effect, you know, talking with Vitalik early on, it's like, we really have to open this up to people who have capital, to developers who can contribute code, uh, and also to miners, yes, but, you know, we need to serve all those audiences. So that was really controversial at the time, and it really took years for, for people to sort of see after Ethereum was successful in, in 2016, 2017, to sort of recognize. But, you know, there's still a lot of people in the Bitcoin ecosystem that, that only want Bitcoin to succeed. But I would offer to them if they believe Bitcoin is the best money in the world, and much of what Bitcoin is used for is as a counterpair to trade against Ethereum or USDT or other assets on the blockchain, they should want to see the growth and success of all these other projects because Bitcoin being money on the other side makes it more valuable because there's more demand for uh, Bitcoin to trade against all these other assets. So, you know, I, I've, I've held that view for a while. There's a lot of early debates. Um, I think it's becoming more accepted, but I, I still find myself needing to encourage people. You know, I wrote an article a while back, embrace the coming Bitcoin fork. You know, I believe that is a positive thing. Having people, you know, with, with the Bitcoin cash uh, community go in their direction, that's positive. Let them go in their direction. And, and it allows, you know, Bitcoin core to focus on what they want to do. You know, there's, there's um, a positive, you know, network effect in diversity and in people trying different experiments. And so I tr try to really embrace that freedom over sort of tribalism. I, I, I can get with that. I can get with that in the sense that I'm definitely a big fan of the free market and of ideas and the battle of ideas. And one of the things I love most about Bitcoin is that it is open source. And so if I was against people taking it and massaging it to be what they wanted, then I, yeah, I'd be against open source. So right. I'm definitely for that. Um, I'm also a big, big advocate of, of getting money right. And, and you know what I mean? And so like, although I'm, I'm obviously very um, interested in like additional applications and whatnot, I also think that like it, it, fundamentally, I'm a fan of the free market. And I believe that if the free market is to succeed, we need a good form of money because it is one half of every transaction. Yep. And it's just far too important to take our eye off that. And I think I, I think we, we, we both agree on that is that the Bitcoin guy should say focus on Bitcoin and it is what it is and it should be what it is. But people who want to tinker around the edges, feel free to do so. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So, so, so David, oh, okay. So that, that, I think that's a pretty, pretty uh, nice line in the sand um, in terms of, you know, kind of some uh, like a contrarian belief. Cause I do agree that that is a very contrarian belief and it's one that I struggle with as well. And I think about a lot and, and as you know, I'm from Toronto originally. And so I had a front row seat with uh, Ethereum and, you know, a mixed, mixed bag of feelings, but, but ultimately who can argue with, you know, the free market. I mean, it is where it is today. And, and um, you know, will it be here 20 years from now? Who knows, but they've definitely brought 
it, you know, this far and, and whether even Bitcoin or Ethereum fail tomorrow, uh, just the fact that they've succeeded to this date, I think is commendable. Um, okay, so just to shift gears on that same question then, do you have any comments around maybe what it, uh, how, uh, like this, uh, what contrarian belief or what truth do you hold that as it applies to kind of the world at large? So let's say outside of our, you know, little Bitcoin ecosystem, any questions on that front? I mean, sorry, any sure. comments on that front? Sure. Well, I mean, I think the impact of um, blockchain is vastly underestimated by the outside world. I hold the truth that effectively all things will be decentralized. That means all things will be open source. All things will be available on a uh, distributed ledger. Right. And that's the largest wealth transfer in human history. And not a lot of people understand that yet, that there's now a new way fundamentally of doing immutable accounting, of, of doing an immutable uh, recording of, of knowledge and of wealth on these blockchains. And that's going to assume all of the world's money, right? That may seem like a, a radical statement today, but it's no more radical than if in 1998, you said, hey, everything's gonna have a website everybody's going to you know be online every all information is going to be available you know the writing was on the wall in 1998 you know and google was launching um and it would be another 15 20 years before grandma was on whatsapp and had a facebook profile and 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 there was was buying things online but it came right and here we are living in that reality so looking today the writing's on the wall right who in 20 years what corporation in 20 years is going to be using non-immutable, non-honest, un untransparent accounting or, you know, still be using uh, wires to send around money that take days at a time and, instead of using blockchain uh, to move wealth or record wealth? You know, this is, this is coming uh, and it's going to be fundamental transition that the world hasn't seen in a very, very long time. Um, and so I think that's that's something to remind ourselves is we're still early in this process. You know, I, I found a Bitcoin in 2012. I thought I was late to the party, right? You know, Bitcoin yeah. was already worth 10 bucks. You know, what was <laughs> I doing in 2009 when this was invented? Why hadn't I heard of this yet? And, uh, you know, I would say we're still early. You know, all the crypto and blockchain assets in the world are, you know, what, three, $350 billion dollars? Um, you know, and so one, think about how far we've come. You know, when I got into Bitcoin, there were 10 million Bitcoin and $10 a piece, meaning all the world's digital assets were $100 million. Mm -hmm. And here we are 2000x later, where there's more than two or $300 billion in digital assets. You know, it's not that far or big a stretch of the imagination to look another 10 to 20 years down the road and say that the 100 or 200 trillion dollars of wealth out there are all going to be on a blockchain. Yeah, couldn't agree more. <laughs> uh, yeah, I hit the like button on that one. So I agree. I agree. I think, I think, uh, I definitely think, uh, yeah, yeah, it's here to stay. Hey, I, I know you're, aren't you in the space a bit? Am I mistaken? Sure. Are, uh, are you in this yeah, space? Uh, yeah, yeah, no. I, I thought it was oh, yeah, yeah. a long time ago. You and, said uh, I'm an investor. Investor in. Yeah, I'm an investor in Space Fund. Uh, really? Yeah, Space Fund, one of the first uh, VCs to do all space investments. You know, I've been into space since I was a I was a little kid. In fact, it was sort of my original inspiration to become an entrepreneur. When I was five or ten years old, I decided I wanted to to you know settle space and go to the moon and mars and and i realized that i'd be able to buy my way right there were there were you know uh you know just sunshine on the horizon that you'd be able to buy a ticket to space at the time and it wouldn't just be nasa engineers and say okay well i'll build tech companies i'll make enough money and then i can uh, go colonize space so nice. <laughs> that nice. set me on my early childhood trajectory of of building companies so do you think we'll use gold or dollars or Bitcoin when we do colonize Mars? 
Um, I don't think we'll be using old fashioned moving around elements. I, I think it'll be electrons of one type or another, uh, whether that's Bitcoin or uh, ether or uh, you name it, but I, it's gonna be digital. You know, nobody's gonna mm. drag around uh, currency or gold. I mean, most, most transactions are already digital, um, but the question comes down to who sets the monetary policy. Right. And it was great to see that uh, Elon Musk, as part of uh, Starlink, their new uh, telecom service, has in their terms of service that you recognize Mars as a free and independent society <laughs> and that they'll they'll set their own uh, rules when uh, when it's eventually settled. Uh, so interesting tip of the hat to sort of the idea that Mars will be its own thing. And if you look at what happened with governance in the new world, when, you know, Europeans came you know, and, and settled uh, North America and South America, they brought effectively the newest systems with them, right? Whether it was uh, patents, you know, are, are, are enshrined in the U.S. Constitution, that was a relatively new idea of the pre previous century from, from England, you know, so anybody could invent something and get the, you know, benefit of that, you know, the king or the, the monarch couldn't uh, sort of dominate innov innovation, it was open to everyone. You know, uh, a lot of those early ideas around free market economics, you know, were coming out of the time. Why was Britain setting the price of tea? Let the market set the price, price of tea. Like all these things, presumptions around free speech and liberty and, you know, um, Pennsylvania was, was groundbreaking at the time because they only had one or two things that had the death penalty. You know, in England, there was hundreds of things you could be put to death for. And so, you know, sort of the liberalization of, of all of these aspects of human life, you know, really set uh, the United States on this trajectory where they would have a much more prosperous economy and free people, and it would be this magnet to draw even more uh, people to uh, to settle and and be involved. And so I think we'll see something very similar with space, where we can take the best of the world systems today and not have any of the legacy systems to worry about. And you'll just see a, an incredible level of prosperity. I don't think humanity has ever seen before. Yeah. Wow. That That's insanely cool. Um, hey, uh, just to switch gears a little bit, what about AI? Have you thought much about it? Um, you know, I think you mentioned that you had or something, but just curious, what are your, th and when I say AI, by the way, I'm not talking about like a car driving itself or, you know, a Google search or even Bitcoin for that matter. I'm talking about more like a general, you know, AI, if you know what I mean. I, I do. Um, I've thought about it a lot. I actually built a company in 2011 between uh, doing the stuff in uh, early internet, renewable energy, and I got into AI in 2011. And the, the challenge has a lot to do with gathering data, right? Accessing all of your data uh, and really getting interesting information back from the AI is largely dependent on the data set that you can give it, um, which is why it's sort of been siloed up until now in Google, Apple, Microsoft. You know, you have to have an enormous, you know, billion person data set to sort of make a lot of these, these this interesting content, right? And so, you know, partly I would say owning your own data is important because that's what's gonna drive the AIs. And so if you care about owning your own data, you're going to be in a much better position, you know, in five or 10 years as, as the systems get better and better uh, to sort of give and get meaning result, meaningful results uh, from more and more advanced AIs. And so I think the, the critical issue is people owning their own data, because otherwise it's going to be companies and governments who get all the benefit from AI. Um, and it ought to be the people that have own and create that data that largely get the benefit. And so we'll, we'll see how things shake out, um, but you know, there's definitely a movement to give people greater power over their own data. And I think that's really, really critical as we get into this AI-powered future. And, and, and do you think, I mean, by the way, I think that's beautifully said, I agree 100%. Do, do you believe that blockchain plays a role in that world? Yeah. Um, people I holding their own data and empowering an AI that, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, Absolutely. Ahead. Blockchain is the means by which you can have those private keys and own that data in a meaningful way, right? So we need blockchains and, you know, token ownership is data ownership, right? That private key, that information. It's also important because AIs are going to be amazingly smart, right? And but they can't subvert the laws of physics. And so as long as cryptography is relatively solid. That's a, that's a good one, by and, the way. I like that. Uh, I like the that laws one. of physics. <laughs> I like that. Buddy. Exactly. We'll the that laws again. of physics <laughs> and, and of numbers. <laughs> the laws of physics and, and laws of, you know, sort of numbers related to cryptography hold, then an AI can't effectively take things. It has to participate in a voluntary and positive way in order to get assets and uh, to be involved, right? Often people talk about the downsides of AI, and I think those, those risks are real, but I point out that like, if you take all the world's bad actors today, all the credit card fraud, all the attacks on systems, they're a very small portion of the world economy compared to all the positive ways that companies using AI today uh, make huge amounts of money, whether it's Google or Microsoft or Amazon or any of them, you know, uh, make money providing positive outcomes. And as long as people have that personal power to make the choice, yes, I think this is good for me. I'm going to buy this product. I'm going to subscribe to this service. As long as people have that choice, it forces the AI and the corporation and the government to act in a much better and honest way. So if you want to keep those systems honest, the best thing you can do is empower people to have that decision-making uh, control. Yeah, I actually, I agree with that. And you're probably the first person I've heard uh, kind of, yeah, verbalize it that way. But yeah, I totally agree. Totally agree. I, th I do think blockchain will play a key in, in unlocking. And it does really worry me that, you know, three or five companies and two governments will pretty much have access to, you know, all this data that we need to feed um, whatever it is that's coming. A little scary. Um, Okay, and then and then and then. Oh, by the way, um, uh, that, fascinating, fascinating. What what about the what about the uh, question around uh, UBI, uh, universal basic income? You said that you had a little bit of kind of uh, I guess exposure there. What were your interest, or rather, what what was uh, yeah? What, what do you got going on there? Well, I think what's what's really interesting um, is you know UBI has emerged in this context of hey, uh, robotics automation is going to reduce uh, again and again the need for human labor and even mental uh, human effort, right, as, as computation and thought becomes commoditized. And so I understand the motivations, uh, but I wrote an article about how UBI can be ethical. And I think it's not through taxes or printing, but through open blockchain systems where everybody can earn tokens for contributing their data, for being involved in the network, for running a, a hardware hotspot for the network. You know, these sort of universal earned income, UEI, uh, that can be, you know, democratized and available to everyone is the best way to realize that idea, not through government fiat, but through these open user-owned networks. That's the key to giving people access to all of this. And it, we're already a long way there, right? You know, people have traded their data, you know, to Facebook and they get free photo storage and they get free messaging to their friends and free phone calls and free blah, blah, blah. Now you can debate whether that's been a good trade or not. You know, Facebook's probably gotten a lot of more money out of them, uh, obviously, since they have a profitable business then the user has gotten back in free services. But if we assert this um, right that people own their own data, then you can start to shift those economics and more and more of the money ought to flow to the people providing that valuable data. Um, just to give you an idea, your data on an annual basis is worth tens of thousands of dollars to these companies. That's how it's spent per person in advertisements on Google AdWords and on Facebook and all these ways to get your attention and get you to make purchasing decisions, 
right? And so if you can imagine a world in which even half of that revenue was shared back to people, you'd have 10, 20, $30,000 a year flowing back to people for their data, for their attention, for all these things. And obviously, cryptocurrency and seamless payments are one of the ways to realize that potential. Yeah, yeah. Hey, have you heard of Yanni's project, uh, Good Dollar? Sure, absolutely. You have, interesting, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Any thoughts on on that and what he's trying to do there with it? Uh, I've, I've, from what I've seen, it's, it's a good project. And, you know, I think the idea um, of rewarding people involved in, in these networks is, is key uh, for them to be successful and for them to be sort of widely accepted. Uh, and there's a lot of people competing in that space for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very interesting. Okay, so David, I, I know we've already kind of zipped through um, most of our time. I wanted to, uh, you know, kind of hit you up with a bit of an open-ended question, which was like, is there anything that you wish I'd asked that I maybe didn't? Uh, is there anything else exciting or newsworthy or whatever that you want to maybe put out there? Um, I think this has been wonderful. I think, uh, you know, tracing through the, the story, the Bitcoin story of, you know, both my lens before I got involved in Bitcoin and, and sort of the, the history of involvement in blockchain in a sense has been Great. And, you know, I'm um, glad we got to touch on, on space. I think that's going to be a very relevant area in the near future. AI, uh, universal earned income, all of these concepts are sort of coming together, you know, and uh, it's going to be interesting. I think things continue to accelerate. And I really, you know, uh, watch sort of the acceleration of technology and, and trends. And, you know, I'm excited about this next year. And, you know, um, it's, it's a bit early, can't quite talk about it, but I'm, I'm, I'm exploring all sorts of new models in, uh, in 2021. And so be excited to, uh, to come back and talk about that at some point. Amazing. Yeah, I would love to. Yeah, anytime. Actually, you want to come back, we, we do another one of these. That would be great. Um, and then I guess just where can people learn more about, you know, you, the projects that you're involved in, in terms of like the websites and yeah. How do people, you know, sure. connect with your ideas? Yeah. Now, the family office website is yeomans.capital. That's Y-E-O-M-A-N-S.capital. And you can see some of the portfolio projects. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's got our basic thesis on there, you know, open source, peer-to-peer, -peer, blockchain, uh, tokenized systems. And yeah, um, I write a lot of Medium. So just search for David Johnston on Medium. Uh, my Twitter is at djohnstonec. And that's, uh, you know, easy way to keep track of me. I'm on LinkedIn, of course. So feel free to send me an invite, you know, 12,000 of my closest friends, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, keep up with me there. And uh, yeah, it's, it's all good. You know, I'm, I'm pretty easy to find. Awesome. Awesome. Well, like David, you've, you've, uh, we've known each other for a very long time. You've been a source of, uh, inspiration, uh, and truth for, you know, for the industry and definitely for myself. So thanks for doing this, my friend. Um, yeah, like I said, let's do it again soon. If there's nothing else, maybe I'll bring this one to a close. Sounds great, Sonny. Wonderful.